Church, I'm Sarah Webb, and I am so pumped that you are joining us today online. What you can expect over the next few minutes is a time of worship, and then we're going to dive into our series titled The Not So United States of America, which is a series all about unity, freedom, and the Christian perspective in the current political climate that we're in. So I want you to get so pumped and be so expectant right now for what God has to teach us today. Guys, we love these Sundays we have together, and we truly hope that you do too. Let's go. Good morning, everyone. Welcome to River City Church. My name is Cody, and we just invite you guys to sing out with us as we worship together. Here we go. I search the world, but it couldn't feel me. empty praise and treasures the faith are never enough you came alone put me back together and every desire is now satisfied here in your Oh, there's nothing better than you. There's nothing better than you. There's nothing, nothing is better than you. I 
sing it out. I'm not afraid. I'm not afraid to show you my weakness. My failures are flows. Lord, you've seen them all, and you still call me friend. He's the God of the mountain. and grace will find me again. Oh, there's nothing better than you. There's nothing better than you. Oh, there's nothing. Nothing is better than you. Oh, there's nothing shame into glory you're the only one who can you turn morning to dancing you give beauty for ashes you turn shame into glory you're the only
week starting back school and 
and just dealing with all the chaos around us. Um, we just want to focus on the, on the fact this morning that God is for us. He's still with us. His blessings are consistent and constant in our lives. So as we sing this next song, just I challenge you not to just sing along with the stream, but to, to pray this, that this promise would, would ring true in your heart and that it would come from a, a place of truth. Because one thing that we will sing is amen over and over again. And what that means is when we say amen, it's done. We believe it. We put our hope and our trust in it, and we leave it there. So I just challenge you to pray this with us and over our church. Children, the children, the children, the 
something that I shared with the, the band this morning. I just feel led to share. Um, as we sing, He is for you. He is with you. We're about to sing, He's, he's bigger than we thought. There's scripture that talks about if we have the faith of a mustard seed, we can move mountains. And for so long, I've been focused on, well, that would never happen. Uh, I've never seen a mountain move. Um, so it feels like I don't have enough faith. Um, but what God has shown me recently just on our own uh, personal walk we've seen mountains move uh, for our family we've seen huge mountains move And normally I'm focused on the mountain and I'm thinking, wow, that was awesome. God did something amazing. The mountain moved. That was, that was amazing. I don't have to worry about that anymore. But as I was preparing and singing that song, He is for you, generation after generation, God reminded me that He's not just moving the mountain for us. He's moving the mountain for a legacy for all those that come after us. Again, God is bigger than we think. We're focused on what's right in front of us and we can just get past that. But we're forgetting that there's generation after generation after generation that God will bless through that promise. So as we sing this song, it's not just for next week. It's not just for school starting back. It's not just for COVID. It's not just for the things that are around us right now. But God, yes, you're bigger than that, but you're bigger than all my faults. You're bigger than all of that. And you can impact generation after generation and, and your legacy can be known through my life, through my children's lives and their children's lives. So I just invite you to sing this song with me and just focus on the bigger picture here. God, we want you to move. We want to fall in love with you, God. We want to be reminded that you're bigger than that mountain.
Thank you this morning for being so much bigger. God, that you're not only dealing with us in the present. You're not only comforting us right now. But God, you already see the legacy. You have us in your hand, God. I pray that our eyes would be opened, that we would accept the peace that you have for us. God, that we would just lean into you and know that you've got this.
thank you for allowing us to worship you this morning, God. We love you. It's your name we pray. Well, good morning, River City. Thank you so much for being with us here today. My name is David Tillman. I'm one of the pastors here. And it's been so incredible to have you guys here worshiping with us online. And I want to say, as we sang, it was incredible. I know you guys enjoyed that so much to be able to worship. We are looking forward to so much to September 13th when we gather back together in this room together to worship as a family. It's going to be incredible. So we're looking forward to that. We're excited today about that. Another thing that we're excited about today is that we're in the midst of a series that is entitled The Not-So-United States of America. We're in week two of this series. Now, the thing that I love about this series so much is that it's kind of risky, isn't it? Because I know that a lot of y'all, you're thinking, we knew that if we put this out there, you guys would say, okay, wait a minute. The things you don't talk about are politics and religion. So you kind of put those things together and you just offer those up. And a lot of you just tuned in, honestly, out of morbid curiosity to see if we just crash and burn this morning. We know that. We know what's going on, but we're glad that you're here. We're also excited about this message today because while things are at a fever pitch, in our country. And we know that there's a lot of division and it goes far beyond there's just an election year this year, right? It go, we know that it goes a lot deeper than that because we have disagreements about like, how dangerous is this virus really? Like how important is it to wear a mask? Should we do it? Should we not do it? Is that a good thing? Is it a bad thing? Should we go back to school? Should we not go back to school? Should we play football? in the fall. And a lot of you are super excited about this one, and then you're worried that somebody's going to have another answer on that. Should we have concerts? That would really help our mood. I don't know. Maybe we shouldn't have concerts. Should we shake hands ever again in our entire lives? And these are the kind of disagreements that we have. And while those things are happening, we can, we can be united this morning. And I learned kind of how this works in my second year of college. My second year of college, I had finished up a lot of my prerequisites, the classes that you have to take. And I had gone to my advisor at the University of Memphis, and he had said to me, hey, we've been talking about this. You have to make a decision. You have to figure out, okay, what is going to be your course of study? Because you're just taking a bunch of things right now that honestly aren't going to count. And so you need to make a decision. You need to come here 8 o'clock in the morning to this room. In those days, there was no online registering. There was no on the phone kind of thing. You show up in this room and you register. So I walk into the room. And when I walk into the room, the line was honestly out the door for this one line. And at the front, it said, undecided. And that was what I was going to register for. Yes, you guessed it. I had decided not to decide. That's what I was going to do. And I was going to register. But apparently I wasn't alone because everybody was in this line lined up. So I'm thinking, what am I going to do? I don't have time for this. I looked over in the corner and there's another line. It's quite a bit shorter. And right above it, it says political science. So I went over there and I thought, well, I'm just, I'm at least going to investigate this and see what is going on. Well, as I got closer to the table and I talked to the person behind the table, this is what he said. Political science is a study of politics and power on a domestic scale, on the international scale, and then also comparatively comparing those systems together. He said, if you decide to study political science, these are the things you're going to learn. You're going to learn about political ideas, institutions, policy, processes, diplomacy, strategy, law, 
and war. And also he said that this is a course of study that a lot of people that are going to head into law school, eventually they will choose this course of study. So as that was kind of on my radar, I thought, this is it. I found a home. The line is short. I'm interested in this. And also it's going to get me maybe where I want to go in life. And so I signed up. I don't know. That may sound like the worst idea for you. You may think, man, that sounds so boring, but I was extremely excited. And then I learned something though, that kind of took my excitement down a few notches after a few days in school. After we started actually discussing some of these political ideas and some of these strategies, I realized something a little disturbing is that no one in my classes saw things the way that I did. I mean, nobody. So all of our classroom discussions kind of devolved into this everybody else versus me kind of situation. And my professors, now they loved it. Because it gave us in the class something to argue about, like everybody else's opinion versus mine. But I didn't like it so much. I thought this was very, very uncomfortable. And what I found out is that like people disagreed with me, but they were also super mad about it. And so while my professors were excited about the exchange that was going on, all the people in my class, they didn't make eye contact with me. So I didn't have a lot of friends in my course of study. So here's what I started to do. I started to view everybody as kind of my opponent. I started to view everybody as my enemy. Like I've got it all together. I've got it right. If everybody would just agree with me, things would be great. And everybody that disagrees with me, I'm gonna study really hard and I'm gonna refine my arguments so that when we have a conversation, I'm going to win. Now, looking back on it and even listen to me talk, do you see maybe that there was another reason why I didn't have a whole lot of friends? Who really wants to hang out with somebody and talk to somebody that views them through that lens? You are my enemy to defeat. So I'm thinking that maybe a lot of that was my fault and not so much their fault. I realize that now that while I was so busy fighting for my way and for my opinion to to reign in those classes, What I had really done is I began to make politics my little G God. And I had this idea in in my head that if I could just work hard enough, if I could just study hard enough, if I could convince enough people, if I could advocate for the right policies, and if the right people got elected in our country, and if they did the right things, then our country was going to be saved. I really felt that way. And I really felt like on the flip side that if I don't do that, And if, in my opinion, the wrong people get elected and the wrong policies get enacted and the wrong things happen, that we are going down the tubes and we're going down the tubes fast. That was literally how I viewed the world. And what about you? I mean, I I think if we're honest with each other, we would at least say this. We would say that a lot of our disagreements are, are so bitter because we say that we look to Jesus. We say that he is our hope, but the way that we interact, I think sometimes can point to the fact that really we're looking to politicians, we're looking to government, we're looking to these structures as if these are where our help comes from and not the God of the heavens. It's really easy sometimes to elevate our idealized view of what the kingdom of America would look like over what the kingdom of God actually is. And I know that was so true for me. And the result is that we begin seeing ourselves as as warriors. We begin seeing ourselves as going out into battle every day, trying to conquer all the people that disagree with us and make enemies out of them. Even, even Christians are brothers and sisters in Jesus. And as Eddie Davis so brilliantly pointed out last week that that's not the design of God for his people, for his church, for brothers and sisters in the family of God. That as Jesus prayed in John 17 before he went to the cross, Father, I pray that they would be one. I pray that they would be united as you and I are united. We have the same mind, God. I pray that would be the same about them. Well, today I want to share with you how God broke into and shifted my warped viewpoint of what this was supposed to look like. And really like a lightning bolt with one verse of scripture from a letter of the Apostle Paul to the Corinthian people, 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 20. This is what he said. Verse 20, therefore, 
We are ambassadors for Christ. Since God is making his appeal through us, we plead on Christ's behalf, be reconciled to God. Now, Paul, as he's writing this letter, he's addressing this to all the Christians in this place at Corinth. And then by extension to me and you as believers in Jesus as well. That includes police officers and personal trainers and moms and teachers. No matter what it is that you do, he says, no, kind of our bigger mission is that we are ambassadors for Jesus Christ. And as you know, an ambassador is somebody that represents someone or something that is not actually physically present in the moment. He says, look, as followers of Jesus, we are to represent him in the world. And this is not a one-time kind of, okay, I'm going to the bullpen. I need Sarah for a minute and, and Sarah's going to come down here and she's going she's to be my ambassador in this moment. No, this is like a 24 hour a day with all of your life, with all of you are, you represent me in this place called planet earth in your sphere of influence. It's what would Jesus look like if he were in our skin and if he lived in our place doing what it is that we do. Listen, Christians, this is pretty exciting. The plan of God to invade this world with his love, to extend to this world his message of reconciliation, that you can have peace with God, his plan for that is you. His plan for that is me making his appeal through us. Now, how does that happen? How can we do that? Well, Paul, in another one of his letters, book of Colossians, chapter one, this is what he says. He says that when we are saved, that this is what happens. He has rescued us from the domain of darkness and transferred us into the kingdom of the son that he loves. He says, so, so when you're saved, when you accept his message of reconciliation and you have peace with God, that you get an upgrade. He says that you were enslaved. You were part of this system. What does he call it? He says the domain of darkness. You were part of this domain of darkness. That there's this system literally on planet earth where people fight for power and for significance and for control. And when we enter into that system, what we do then is we try to become kind of little mini kings and queens of our own. And we, we try to consolidate power with people that agree with us. And we try to consolidate enough power that our group is more powerful than their group. And, and when that group is more powerful than this one, then we will have won. And that is how the kingdom of this world actually works. But he says, look, as believers, what's happened actually is that you've been transferred out of that system. You've been transferred out of that kingdom. And what's cool about it is we're not transferred out of that kingdom so that we can go out to the desert for a little while and just chill until it's all over with. Not so that we can go and sit on the sidelines. He says, hey, I'm, I'm bringing you out, but then I'm going to send you back. And you're not going to be a citizen. You're not going as a citizen of that kingdom anymore. You're coming as a representative of mine. As a representative of Christ, I'm sending you back in, not to fight for power. No, it's, it's different now. You're going to represent me. You've got a, a different mission. And in fact, you've got a different message. Let's look at that verse again. This is what he says that our message is. He says, we're ambassadors for Christ. God is making his appeal through us. So what's the appeal? We plead on Christ's behalf, be reconciled to God. So the first part of the message is to non-Christians. Hey, there is peace available. Come and, and be reconciled to God. Come bow your knee to him and he'll transfer you out of the kingdom that you're in. And you can come over here and be sent back as his representative. You can have peace with God. And then the second part of the message, he said just a few verses before in verse 15. 2 Corinthians 5, 15, he says, and he died, speaking of Jesus, for all, so that those who live should no longer live for themselves, but for the one who died for them and was raised. So the first part of the message is to non-Christians, come be reconciled to God. And the second part of it is, hey, Jesus' death, 
the purpose for it. He came and died so that you and I, the ones of us that are in Christ, would not live for ourselves, but that we would live for him, that we would represent him on the earth, that we would worship him alone. Because I don't know about you, but here's what I've noticed in my life. I've noticed that in my life, I have this tendency as a follower of God, as an ambassador of Jesus to return to my default settings, if you will, to try to build my own little mini kingdom. It can go quickly from God, your will be done, your kingdom come to my will be done, my kingdom come. And it happens so fast that sometimes I don't even notice it. This is the biggest obstacle for me. And I think that that's why as you read through the gospels that one thing that Jesus did constantly is to remind us of this fact. He said, hey, when you come to me that you give up your rights to yourself. He said things like, no one can serve two masters. He said that if you want to come after me, that you should deny yourself. You take up your cross daily, come and, and follow after me. That if I'm going to be on the throne of your life, that first of all, it has to be empty. You have to come down from the throne so that I can sit up on it. Now, all that said, how then does this change? How, how would this unify us as believers and in the middle of everything that we're going through? And then how also would that affect our world? I think there's two, two ways. There's probably a lot more, but two ways I want us to look at this morning that this has deeply affected me and I think can be really helpful for us as well. The first thing is that I think it causes us to see that people are not the real enemy. That yes, there's a battle raging in this world. Yes, there is a clash of kingdoms going on, but it is not primarily mine versus them. It's not us versus them. It is literally the kingdom of God versus the kingdom of the demonic. And you say, Dave, wait a minute, you lost me there. That sounds a little overboard. Well, let me, let me show you. Ephesians chapter 6, verse 12. This is what the apostle said. For our struggle is not against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, against the authorities, against the cosmic powers of this darkness, against evil spiritual forces in the heavens. Paul said there is a war going on, not trying to deny that. I see that. I see that there's clashes going on, but, but he's saying what I want you to see is that it's not primarily you against the person that you see in front of you. They're on the front lines, yes, but this is a lot bigger than that. There's a war going on in the heavens, and it is a war between those who are called by the name of God and the kingdom of this earth. And he's saying, so, so when you step back from it and really see that, it changes everything. People are not really the enemy. After all, we follow a Savior that said this. He said, love your enemies. Love them as you love yourself. Well, how can we do that? I think one of the ways that we can do that is we can see that our battle is not really ultimately with them. When you're dismayed or when we're dismayed by injustice or, or by evil in our world as we look around, what does that cause us to do? It causes us to pray. It causes us to pray and say, God, your kingdom come. God, give me wisdom. How do you want me to represent you as your hands and feet in this place where I live? What is it that you want me to do, God, so that your kingdom would come? And I think that the second way that this affects us is this, this unites us as followers of Jesus, as people in his family. Yes, there are disagreements, of course, about how all of this stuff should play out over methodologies, over strategies, and over all these things. Yes, there are d disagreements, but we don't have to agree about all of that to be unified around the fact that our message and our mission is the same to reconcile people to God. And then those of us that belong to God, let's not live for ourselves, but let's live for him. And it frees us up to love as Jesus loved. Now, I love this description in, in John chapter one of what was it like, do you think, to be on the other side of Jesus? How did Jesus love? If we're to be a representative of his, when he was here, what did that actually look like? And this is what John says about Jesus. 
He says the word, speaking of Jesus, became flesh and it dwelt among us. We observed his glory, the glory as of the one and only son from the father. This is how he describes him, full of grace and truth. Grace and truth. That when you were on the other side of Jesus, what that felt like is that you were going to experience truth, absolutely, but you were also going to get a heavy dose of grace. And as you read through the Gospels, that's what you see. It's, pretty, it's really incredible. I challenge you just to read through there. And as, as Jesus encounters people that are ensnared in sin, what, is, what does he do? He always brings grace to them and he always brings truth. One quick example is this, woman caught in the midst of adultery. Maybe you've heard this story or not. She's brought by the religious leaders and thrown down in front of Jesus. And they say to Jesus, Jesus, this woman was caught in the act of adultery. The law says that she ought to die. What do you say? So you see the conundrum there. If he says, well, I say, you know, don't worry about it. Then they would say, well, oh, well, he's saying that the law doesn't matter. But if he's saying, yes, just go ahead and kill her, then they'll feel justified. And there's there's no grace as part of the equation. But this is what Jesus does. He steps back and he says, okay, this is what we're going to do. Whoever standing around here has no sin, whichever one of you has no sin, go ahead and throw the first stone. Let's, Let's get this over with. And then he just stands back to watch. And it says from the youngest down to the oldest, they just started to drop their stones and walked away. Because as they examined their hearts, they knew that there was no way that they could throw that stone. And as they're finally all gone and she looks up at Jesus, Jesus says, well, where are your accusers? And she says, well, there aren't any. And he says, well, I don't condemn you either then, but go and sin no more. Grace and truth. Jesus says, yes, there's an offer of grace on the table. I extend that to you. You are loved by God. But then, yes, the truth really matters. And he brings both of those things into the equation. And what I've seen in in our system, if we step back from it in our our country, that when we really, when we start to look, talk about politics and kind of how we're governed, that what our political parties, what our political systems, and there are varied ones of them, what we tend to do is we tend to emphasize one of those things and de-emphasize one of the others. We tend to say, yes, yes, let's, what we need is a whole, whole lot of truth. And then, well, what about grace? Uh, maybe we would de- de-emphasize that. No, no, what we need is, is so much, we need a lot of grace. Well, what about truth? Does truth matter? Uh, And we tend to, at varying different levels, have the sliders kind of up and down however we want them. But if we get involved in that system and we adopt those platforms from our kingdom of America, what tends to happen to our hearts is that we tend to fall in line with that. What the people that believe like us, whatever they emphasize, we emphasize. What they de-emphasize, we de-emphasize. And so what can happen is that we can shift back into creating our own little kingdoms. But God says, no, I want you to be over here on this side with me speaking to this world and I want you to hold grace. I want you to hold truth and I want you to offer both of those back to the world. You know, and as Scott Sauls, the author, I love how he says this. He said that as he's tried to do this in his life, in his words, as he's tried to follow the whole Jesus, he says that the outcome of this is that he's too conservative for liberals and he's too liberal for conservatives. And how do we, how do we know if it's affecting us this way? How do we know if the truth of God has affected our hearts? I think the way that we'll know it is that it will move us in one way or the other. That we will begin in more and more in varying degrees to become more full of grace and truth, like the one that we represent. That we will stop de-emphasizing things that are important to him, that are part of the heart of God. Because after all, if Jesus comes onto the scene, he doesn't come to kind of take sides one way or the other, but just to take over and his authority is what matters. You know, I experienced a crisis about 20 years ago where I realized that I was not doing a great job of this in my life. As a college graduate, 
and then also as a, uh, as a sheriff's deputy here in our county. I was assigned right out of the academy to work for the warrant division for the fugitive squad. And so what we would do is we would go out and find people that were wanted on warrants. And it could be anything from you missed court and the judge says, hey, go get them or all the way up to murder. It was kind of everything in between. And I, I loved it. It was super fun. But here's, here's one of the things that I didn't love is that I noticed over time after dealing with all kinds of depravity and all kinds of evil day in and day out and being surrounded in it, that my heart began to change. And what began to happen in my heart and in my life is that I began to be very, very cynical. I began to view whole kind of parts of town as like, yeah, you don't want to go over there. This is kind of what that's like. And just painting with a broad brush. I, I started being very impatient and I started being uh, very critical of people that I love, people that were around me. I started to not actually trust people that I had known for years and concerned about what was going on in, in my own heart. I, I went to God one night after I got off work and I just got on my face. I said, God, I don't know what's happening to me. I don't want to be the person that I am. And I feel this change happening in me, but God, I don't feel like I can change it. I need you to change me. I need you to show me, God, what is it that I'm not seeing? What piece of the puzzle is missing for me, God? The next day, I went to work. And my partner and I, the, the warrant that he had pulled for the very first person that we were going to go out and look for was a drug warrant. 18-year-old, inner city and we go out and as I'm going there, I'm like, okay, I already know kind of what we're going into. I know what this is going to be like. I know what this person is going to be like. I know everything about this. We get there and we find the guy and we arrest him. We get him in the back of the car. And for what I thought were good motives, and maybe some of it was good, I don't even, I don't even know now, but I decided I was going to give this guy a heavy dose of truth when he got in the car. I thought, well, I'm going to help him because I'm just going to explain to him how life works. And once I do that, everything's going to be great because he clearly doesn't get it. He's clearly going nowhere fast. And so we're sitting there in the police car and the conversation goes like this. His name was Najee. I said, Najee, what, uh, why are you out here doing this, man? Why are you dealing drugs? You know, this isn't going to take you anywhere good. You know, this doesn't, this doesn't end well. And he said, well, this isn't, this isn't what I wanted to do in life at all. In fact, I don't want to, I wish that there was a way out for me right now. I don't, I don't know how else to live. And I said, well, why aren't you in school? The school that he went to was about a hundred yards this way. I'm like, hey, well, you dropped out of school. What did you think was going to happen? And he said, well, sir, I didn't, didn't want to drop out of school, but when you don't have anywhere to live and when you're hungry, it's hard to really concentrate at school. And it's hard to, to get there when you don't even know where you're going to sleep at night. And I said, well, where's your mom? Does your mom know that you're out here doing this? I mean, she has to be upset. And he said, my mom, she's on drugs and, and she's living a, a lifestyle where I haven't even seen her in about six or eight months. And I said, okay, well, what about your dad? And he said, well, my dad, he was locked up when I was a kid and I haven't seen him in a long time either, probably years. Well, what about your grandparents? I'm starting to kind of get desperate here. And he said, well, my grandparents aren't around anymore either. And I don't have anybody that I know that I could go to and live with. And he said, what I did is I went to a friend and I asked their parents, can I stay with you for a little while? He goes, but after a while, people get tired of you living on their couch. And so eventually they just kicked me out. And he said, I, I mean, I didn't know what else to do. I was hungry. I didn't have a place to live and, and I didn't even have anywhere to, to wash my clothes or do any of that kind of stuff. And so, so how am I supposed to go to school? How am I supposed to pay attention? And the only thing that I could find to even make some money was to do what I'm doing. And so that's how I ended up. I was floored. Floored just because, first of all, I didn't even know that people were in this situation. I guess maybe I thought I did, but I, I didn't really let it sink into my head that not very far from where I live that people are in this situation. And then secondly, I thought, you know, he, here I am trying to give this guy a heavy dose of truth, and I don't know really anything about the world that he lives in. And in that moment, I just began to pray. I was like, God, I don't, I don't know what to say anymore. I thought I was going to straighten everything out and I don't know anything. And it's, it's like God whispered to me in that moment, you're right, you don't. But you did pray for this. You said you wanted to know what's really going on. You said you, you wanted to be broken out of, of the ignorance that you're living in. That's what I'm trying to do for you right now. 
And so what I did is I, I just told Najee with the time that we had left, I just told him, man, I'm, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. And I, I want to tell you about something. I, I, I wish that I could do more for you, but I want to tell you about the God that I serve. And Najee said, hey, I know, I know about God. And, and turns out he was a follower of Jesus too. And he said, I know about that. And I, and I just, life is so hard, man. I wish that, would you pray for me? Would you just pray for me when you think about me in the next few weeks? I said, well, absolutely, I pray with you. And the most unlikely thing happened. We're sitting there in front of 201 Poplar, which was a jail in the county at the time. And he turns to me and with tears just rolling down his face, bitter tears, he's crying. And he says, he says, all I've ever wanted in my whole life, all I've ever wanted was for somebody to love me and to care about me. I didn't think that's how that story was going to end. All he's ever wanted in his whole life was somebody to love him and to care about him. Here I was, I'm walking into this situation with this giant truth sledgehammer thinking, I'm going to straighten all this stuff out. And I really didn't know anything. And God is saying, if you if you're going to be more like me, you're going to, yes, yes, truth, that's, that's good. Yes, there's consequences for your actions. Yes, dealing drugs is bad. And yes, you do end up in jail. And I didn't feel sorry for locking him up or for being a police officer. No, this is great. Thank God for our police officers. That's not the point. The point is that on the other side of that, as there's, as there's truth, that if our hearts are going to be like the God that we represent, that we have to be full of grace as well. And as he headed off into jail, he asked me, would you, would you pray with me? And so there we were, the most unlikely of friends in the entire universe, the, a police officer and a drug dealer praying before he goes off into jail. And I've thought about it so many times since then and prayed for him. But God broke my heart in that, in that moment. And I've thought about it so many times as I've gone back and said, man, God, would you give me a heart? Yes, that's, that's, fired up about truth, absolutely, but would you give me a heart that's more like yours, that's full of grace, full of mercy, and would you allow me to hold those two things together? You know, Chuck Colson, who was once an advisor to Richard Nixon, and once he got out of prison, he was indicted and went to prison over the whole Watergate scandal. When he got out of prison, he founded what's called Prison Fellowship. And through that ministry, thousands and thousands of inmates have given their heart to Jesus Christ. And, you know, Chuck Colson said this before he died. He said, you know, I meet so many people all the time. Everywhere I go, when I try to speak and I say, they tell me, where is the hope? Where is the hope? They say, Chuck, I, I look around and I'm kind of demoralized by all the decay that I see around me. Where is the hope? And he said, I always say to them, the hope that each of us has. Is, is not in what laws are passed. It's not in who governs us and it's not in what great things we do as a nation, but the hope that each of us has is in the, is in the power of God working in the hearts and the minds of people. And that's where the hope of us is today, individually, and that's where our hope is as a nation. Would you pray with me? God, as we seek to be your representatives, God, forgive me when I default back to my kingdom and, and my will. But I really do want your kingdom, God, and your will to be done. God, I want to love what, what it is that you love, and I want to represent you well in my world, in my sphere of influence. So God, I pray that we'd hold that message out today, that there's hope for the world. There's, there's reconciliation. There really is peace with the God of the universe. And for anybody that's maybe listening today and and has never come to Jesus and maybe thought that if they did, that they would, they would just be crushed by him. I pray that they would encounter your grace today. That yes, our sin is, 
an offense to you, that yes, that matters, but with you there is grace. Therefore, you are loved and feared, God. If you don't know him today, I pray that you'd come to him and you'd experience his grace, his peace in your life today. And God, I pray that us, those of us at River City Church, that we would be good ambassadors of you in our community, in our families, in this country, God, that we would hold out your grace and your truth and we would represent you well to a watching world. In Jesus' name.
Well, thank you so much to the band for leading us this morning, as well as to David for sharing what he shared today with all of us. I know for all of you at home and wherever you are, you've been encouraged through the worship and also through that challenging message that David offered today, just like I was. And so our prayer and our hope for all of you is that in this season that we're in, is that you would know, you would experience just this this peace and this joy that only God can give you in your soul. And that's our prayer for you. Uh, Before we let you go, just a few quick announcements. As David said earlier, we sent the announcement out this past week. But in four Sundays from today, on September the 13th, we're going to be back here in this room together. And so we hope many of you that feel comfortable that you will show up. We're going to offer two services, 9.30 and 11 a.m. We will be putting more information out as to what you can expect, as to some of the things, the policies, if you will, or practices we'll have in place to keep everyone safe this coming week. So look for that. Uh, Also, next Sunday, I'll be continuing this series that we've been in now, the Not-So-United States of America. And I'm going to be speaking on a very, what I think is an important subject that all of us care about. I'm I'm going to speak on liberty or freedom. And really what it means when you think about God and when you think about our Constitution and our country. And so I want to invite you to tune in next week for that. Uh, Also, next Sunday, we are going to offer here in person from 4.30 till 6 p.m. what we call a lab. Now, these are just basically more intimate gatherings or environments that we set up here. And we're going to kick this first one off for the next two Sundays. We're going to talk about managing your anxiety and your depression in the midst of a pandemic. And next week, I'm really excited to have a good friend of mine joining me for this first kickoff. He is a psychologist. He works in this area, works with mental health. He's been helping a lot of people by giving them hope in the midst of just their struggles. And he's going to join me next week. And so if you haven't signed up for that and you're interested in that, you can email us at info at rivercitymemphis.org info at rivercitymemphis.org. We will send you the registration and we will send you more details. Uh, Also, you can find out info online, Facebook, and other ways as well. Uh, Lastly, before we let you go, if you have been giving to River City Church financially, thank you so much. Uh, As David was saying today, this really, what we're about as Christians here in the world, is about bringing light, the light from heaven into this world. And so every dime you give to your church in faith, God is using it here for us to continue to share his love with the world. Thank you all. We love you. Look forward to seeing many of you soon. Take care.